I'm Jason Dover, VP of Product Strategy at Kemp Technologies. We're super excited to be at Security Field Day, uh, chatting about the topic of network detection and response. In this section, uh, we'll be discussing principles and approaches for network threat detection. This is going to lay the groundwork for looking deeper at the Kemp Flowmon uh, NDR product line and how these approaches uh, is leveraged within our product stack. So quick question for you. Have you ever thought about the difference between a puzzle and a mystery? Uh, this is something that's been covered in a variety of more recent editorial works uh, after certain scandals that have made the news. Malcolm Gladwell, fairly famous writer, today talked about this in The New Yorker. Here's the interesting thing. It's described that a puzzle is something that has a simple factual answer that's solved simply by getting more information. Right? If you increase the collection of intelligence, you get closer to the answer. Imagine the location of a single bad guy. All you really have to do is find an informant that either is willing or can be coerced or bribed into telling you about where they last saw the bad guy, right? Think about this from a cyber perspective. If you wanted to find out, you could fairly easy see who the first genius was that opened the I love you email within your infrastructure and launch the I love you bug into your email environment, helping you to have a really good day, right? All you got to do is go look at the logs, right? Uh, however, mysteries are different. Mysteries, they have contingencies. They're solved not by just getting more information. You've got to get the right information, and you've got to analyze it. Think of your favorite uh, Agatha Christie or Sherlock Holmes story, right? The fact that you know uh, that the driver, the butler, the ex-wife and two stepchildren that were excluded from the will were all at the house when the victim lost his life. That doesn't make it any easier for you to figure out the crime, right? In fact, it does the opposite. It makes it more difficult to understand it sometimes the more information you have. It's really about the analysis that you're doing and getting access to the right information. Think for a moment back not so distant past to the Stuxnet virus, right? And of course, there's all sorts of still arguments of what state actor actually developed it, uh, but that malware had pretty devastating effects. It attacked SCADA systems, attacked Windows. But think about it, a lot of information actually was available, right? Here, uh, there was knowledge of it for some five years before it started showing up in places it shouldn't. It was a zero-day attack written in C and C++, which weren't very common for that type of malware. It was digitally signed with private keys from known and trusted entities, and it had the ability to sit in plain sight dormant until the correct operating environment was introduced. And so just getting the information really, really wasn't enough. You had to be able to interpret it properly. You had to have access to the right information as well. And that's the point. The complexities of modern IT demand not just information, but the right information. So more dashboards aren't really going to do it for you. You've got to have the right techniques and the right framework in place. This is why uh, it's our belief that network detection and response is a really key element to helping you to solve this challenge, these problems. And just think some things about what we've been seeing recently, right? Increase of infrastructure attacks, increase of ransomware. Why is this? Well, you've got legacy infrastructure that's sitting right alongside uh, IoT infrastructure, which doesn't necessarily have the best track record. So you've got this Petri dish that's rich for getting attacks, basically. I mean, I mentioned to you in my, in my intro about the fact that we, or that I used to work in the finance industry, and you'd be surprised. I mean, well, I know some of you wouldn't from your backgrounds too, but the largest financial industries, uh, companies, the legacy infrastructure that's still there, held together by tape and strings, it's very, very surprising. And so now you're introducing insecure IoT infrastructure on top of that. This is why we're seeing the increase in infrastructure attacks. You know, if you check the right places of the internet or the wrong places, depending on your, your mindset, you can literally find service providers that will provide you with ransomware as a service platforms. And so the numbers and figures that we've seen over the last couple of years supports this. Identity access continues to add complexity as well. IT still has the, the challenge of balancing security versus usability. If I make people change their password every other day and require 15 special characters, 
well, that's a problem, but I can't let people have their password be password either. <laughs> but this is a, a key conduit for attacks. Again, without having to rewind back too far, think of the solar winds attack of just a few months ago uh, with the teardrop exploit. Where did that start from? Stolen credentials that was able to be used to uh, get lateral movement and launch remote access exploits. And then once I'm in there, they used uh, file uh, replacement techniques and a number of other methods that were of course disastrous. The last challenger complexity is then zero day and polymorphic attacks. Of course, Stuxnet, which we mentioned, just as an example, that's both zero day and polymorphic. But again, we don't have to go back that far in history. Just earlier this month, the Hafnium attributed uh, zero day threat attacks against Microsoft, where an attacker could get access to the exchange system, exchange mailboxes, and then launch additional uh, pieces of malware. And the point here, right, is that the frequency of the occurrency, occurrence, excuse me, of these things is the norm now. We just covered a couple of examples that we hear about, but when you look at Verizon and other people's reports, we can see that there's a lot that we don't hear about that has a very significant negative impact on the industry as a whole. So what do we do here? How do we solve it? Well, we put in different pieces of infrastructure to try to help us to mitigate it, right? You've got your uh, edge security, your perimeter security, you know, your firewalls, IDS, et cetera. And this is a start, but it's not the whole picture because I'm really only able to address traffic that vertically transits the boundaries of my network ecosystem. So I go to the other end of the spectrum, right? I, I deploy endpoint security to make sure I can protect users from their self. Uh, help uh, prevent uh, the endpoints themselves from being compromised. I'd add in there also application layer security. So uh, things like web application firewall, looking at what's going on at the higher portions of the network, making sure I'm integrated with my IAM appropriately and so forth. But again, that's limited because that gives me narrow and deep visibility again on only one slice. The question then comes up of who's watching the network, right? If you think about either end of these things, there are ways and there are methods for threat actors to abstract what they're doing, to hide themselves, to use file replacement techniques, to change logs and wipe my footprints away. There's even, in one of the examples we're going to see later, the fact that it's possible to abstract uh, malicious payloads in what looks like normal traffic flows. So having a deep understanding of what's going on in the network is critical. You normally are going to have to leverage network communications to successfully carry out your attack. And this is why security and visibility from a network point of view is oftentimes advantaged when it comes to the later stages of the attack. So let's say someone's got in, They've even compromised uh, a device or a set of devices. In order to carry out the exfiltration, you can't hide that, right? And so in order to capture that, you need the right tools. And I'm sure many have seen this before, the SOC visibility triad or security visibility triad as it's sometimes uh, referred to. The point is that each of these addresses a different part of the anatomy of an attack, which we're gonna look deeper into. The point of having all three covered is that you want to increase the probability of catching attacks and catching them earlier. Let's just briefly spend a couple minutes on each of them. Um, like we referenced already, compromised credentials are a big part of the exploit world, right? There's some statistics that say over 80% of successful hacks are actually related to compromised credentials. So having a deep understanding of what normal behavior looks like versus what abnormal behavior looks like is really important, right? Someone tries to log in 200 times in less than a second, it's probably not really a user. You should do something about it. Maybe cut that device off from the network, right? Combined with that is that, well, if you've got a large user environment, I need some way to collect all those logs, aggregate them and parse them and dealing with email alerts, Manually going through logs, it just doesn't work with the scale of networks that we're dealing with. And so that's why both uh, user behavior analysis, as well as a way to aggregate the logs and insight are really key. The second part is EDR, uh, endpoint detection and response. You know, once 
uh, an asset or set of assets are compromised, this prevents a huge problem because from that point, I'm one step closer to now getting privileged access, which can be a real disaster. You're, you're on the back foot at that point. So having real time endpoint protection and response is another key pillar. And the third piece, and where Kemp comes in with the Flowmon product line is network detection and response. Now, historically, this was referred to as NTA or network traffic analysis. NDR is probably a bit of a newer acronym that's been thrown into the, into the industry. But this is really about identifying intrusions across the network, uh, giving you a way to triage them and also narrow down to what really matters, right? So that you can filter out some of the noise and incident responders and SOC operators can get to the stuff that really, really matters. Effectively helping you to get ahead of things getting to their actual impact state. You, you may not be able to catch the exploit right at the beginning, but you want to catch the breadcrumbs before the full impact of the exploit comes up. You know, oftentimes it's, uh, you know, we see in Hollywood that the bad guy, the threat actor hacking into the mainframe and the good guy sees them and they're going back and forth and setting holes for each other. We know as security practitioners, that's not how it works. It's many small wins that ultimately lead up to the successful attack. NDR is about finding and detecting those, helping you to understand what's anomalous so that you can then stop it and prepare for the next time that it happens. And so if you put these three components in place together, you've got a better chance, not a 100% chance, but a better chance at cap, cap, catching uh, those potential compromises early. The second piece is having the right framework. Um, if you just have the tooling in place, but you don't actually have the right framework in place, you could still somewhat be going in circles. And what we've found and what we've found from our customers is that the MITRE organization provides a really useful framework for thinking about threat detection, response, and really understanding the anatomy of an attack. Uh, for those not familiar with uh, MITRE, it's a government funded uh, research organization that was spun out of MIT. They're funded by NIST and have connections with all sorts of uh, three-letter acronym uh, government agencies. The, the point of the framework is that it provides a blueprint of how threat actors will use tactics, techniques, and procedures to carry out an attack. The, it was originally developed to help provide a common language, common vocabulary, and way of looking at things for blue teams, red teams, and vendors, because now you're able to pool resources and efforts to get ahead of potential threat actors. It also provides a, a useful way for red teams to play offense, right? It's not just about knowing the anatomy of an attack so that you can prevent it from happening, uh, but you can also pretend to be the attacker, right? In a preparatory way, uh, so that you can set up a more robust infrastructure uh, for dealing with threat actors and potential attacks. Now, what you see in the slide is the MITRE attack framework somewhat overlaid on the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain along the horizontal, which many may be a bit more familiar with. The point of the attack framework was to go a bit deeper though, right? Uh, the, the Lockheed framework provides a basic overview of what the anatomy of an attack and the methods look like. The attack framework goes several layers deeper and focuses a bit more on the exploit life cycle. Uh, if you check out the, the website, if you haven't already, there's actually over 250 uh, techniques and sub techniques. And the point is just to get a really deep understanding of what are the types of things that happen at the different phases of an attack. The, the difference of this versus just relying on IOCs or indicators of compromise is that I would say those are somewhat rear view mirror looking, right? If you think about common IOCs that you get from threat intelligence, such as AV signatures, file names, hashes, IPs, it's about what's happened in the past. A framework like this is really about helping you to prepare what's for the future. There was a recent update as well. As you see, it was previously split into two. What is an attacker doing before they launch and what are they doing after? Uh, the pre-attack framework actually was, uh, uh, was uh, retired and now it's all been kind of brought into one. So you've got one view to see what the anatomy of an attack looks like from the prep stage all the way through to the impact stage. And if you haven't yet 
highly recommend you check out the, the MITRE uh, TAC website, tons of good resources and research. And so what we find is that even as we build our security products, looking at it through the lens of this framework is a really useful way to help our customers protect themselves. Now, the next up would be having the right intelligence, right? And you can think of threat intelligence, we're all familiar with threat intelligence platforms, the threat intelligence feeds. It really is about information that's been acquired from previous breaches and investigation. So I did mention it is rear view mirror looking, but that doesn't mean it's not useful, right? If I understand that attacker A typically leverages these IP address, these websites, these servers, these commands, this types of infrastructure, well, it does give me a bit of prediction because if I see things that looks like that threat actor or that adversary again, I can understand what's likely to happen next. And that's really the point of threat intelligence. And of course you can get feeds from FireEye, CrowdStrike and a variety of other sources. Those feeds are used to enrich the investigation of a SOC analyst or of a threat responder. Now I hope what's becoming clear here is that there is no one magic single bullet. That's really what we always try to help our customers understand. Sometimes customers say, what's the one tool or set of products that I need that's gonna secure my entire environment? The point is that that doesn't exist, right? It's putting these different methods, these different techniques and these different tools together, that's the key. Now, the last part before we get into the product overview uh, is that of the methods, right? So we've got the tools, I've got the intelligence, I've got the framework that I'm gonna operate in, I need the actions of how I'm gonna do it. And so a question that often comes up when we engage with customers and they're thinking about bringing some sort of network security monitoring uh, insight into their environment, the question that arises is, do I go with a full packet approach or do I go with flow data? If you rewind back in history, monitoring your network for security from a flow perspective, may have been seen as somewhat of a second-class citizen. And it's understandable because you're going to get the absolute highest level of fidelity by doing full packet capture. Right? With full packet capture, I'm getting a mirror image of everything that's going on in the network. A flow approach effectively is giving you a summary of what your connect connections have been up to. Right Now, at its simplest, what is flow data? Well, the flow is a five tuple data point that includes information about network communications, your source IP, desk IP, source port, desk port protocol. And of course that can be enriched with a bunch of additional information. So the question is the difference that exists between the approaches, is it meaningful, right? Again, historically this was the case, but with vendors like Kemp, we've introduced a bunch of intelligence into our method that helps to supplement the gap that you may have traditionally seen between full packet capture and flow. We do this by having intelligent probes that adds additional layer seven metadata. And we also have uh, what I would call just in time full packet capture. And so if we're monitoring the network, we're looking at flows. If an event happens, starts to happen, or we believe it's about to happen, we have the ability to do an on-demand full packet capture to further enrich the insight that we have about what's going on in the ecosystem. The other question though then just becomes practicality, right? When we had one meg networks doing full packet capture and everything was feasible from a cost perspective, scale perspective, and so forth. But with 10 gig, multi-gig, multi-terabyte ecosystems, that's just not always very practical. From a sampling point of view, flow is just going to scale better for your environment. Right? You can sample somewhere between one out of 64 to one out of 100 packets for gigabit scale bandwidth ecosystem. Uh, for multi-gig to multi-terabyte, you can do around one out of 1,000 to one out of 10,000, as opposed to mirroring everything that's going on. And you can kind of see how it progresses. You could very, very quickly with a high bandwidth network get to the point uh, where you're just running out of scale you're running out of capacity. And so our basic recommendation is well, leverage a solution like Kemp Flowmon, where we rely on flow data primarily, but we are able to get access to full packet information when and as you need it. And in the demo we're about to go in, you'll see the depth of insight that you can get by leveraging this method.
a couple of other things that just come up there. You also just have simplicity, right? There's no cabling of mirror ports. You don't have to worry about mirror port overloading and the technical expertise to analyze the data, which really is the important part anyway, is normally a bit lower when you're dealing with flow-based reporting as opposed to full packet capture. So plenty of benefits, as you probably guessed, our method relies primarily on flow, but we also are able to use full packet capture for supplementing the insights that we see. Uh, Jason, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, you mentioned layer seven um, metadata. So is this particularly good at, at uh, detecting certain types of attacks and um, more at the higher layer and less at the lower layers? How, how does that sort of come together? Pavel, maybe you want to take that question and give a bit more depth, and this will be a good prep for the couple demos that you're about to show. So the, the primary mechanism is, as Jason mentioned, flow data. So that's the baseline. That's what the detection methods are using for machine learning, for adaptive baselining, heuristics, all these algorithms I'm going to talk about. But in application layer data, there are quite interesting information, right? Like DNS. So if the device is translating over a DNS a domain that is known for being malicious, I can report that right away if I have the threat intelligence data. So that's the, that's the ability to leverage uh, layer seven information in the threat detection. Or there are things like JA3 fingerprints. So when the devices are establishing TLS session, they exchange certain information like what is the cipher suites that are available, what versions of TLS can be supported. And from that, you generate a specific fingerprint of the device and there are known fingerprints for malicious traffic. Or you can, you can use simple use cases such as which of my servers are actually still speaking TLS 1.0, which should be already deprecated or TLS 1.1. So this is the additional insight that the layer seven metadata that are included in the flow records will actually give you. So you don't need to have the full package trace all the time to have this information available. I got one question too, if I may. Um, uh, Jason, you mentioned that uh, you don't have to, to worry about uh, uh, mirror ports and, and overloading them and uh, all of that. Um, but uh, flow data also needs to be picked up somewhere. And that's also something we need to carefully um, find a good spot or uh, add some additional resources to, to grab them. Um, so how, how, how are you doing that? I, I guess you're doing that in the, in the presentation coming up. Yeah, we will, and I'm sure Paul will add to it, but nothing's for free, right? If I'm, if I'm going to ship packets or ship even flow data information across the network, I do have to account for it that my environment can handle it. The point here is just that it scales better and takes less capacity and less storage than what you would have to otherwise deal with with full packet capture. For us, we can take flow data directly off of switches and infrastructure that supports exporting flow information. And we do also have uh, probes that can get deployed some of the more advanced, fancy, smart stuff that I mentioned as well, you get that when you leverage our probes for capturing flow information off the network infrastructure. Yeah, but as soon as you use probes, you need some way of getting the packets again. So that's, yeah, that's a mirror port all over again, or you're using a tap, but then you have only have one link. So um, you, you're getting back to the same problem. So in a way, the mirror port is always going to be some, some issue that you're going to have. You, you are absolutely correct, Jesper. The, the mirror port, when you want to use the probe, the mirror port is always there, either a local or ER span or through a packet broker. So it's, it's always there. But the, but the power of the solution is in the hybrid approach. You don't need to mirror port like all the data. You can actually do a hybrid deployment where, for example, from the branch offices, you will get the network telemetry from the Cisco routers that are deployed there. From the corporate data center, you get a probe. And then you have your AWS deployment where you get VPC flow logs. So that's, that's the power of the hybrid approach that we have in Flowmon. And we can combine these different types of data, normalize them, store them, and process them 
with the data processing pipeline, visualization, reporting, anomaly detection. So that's that's the way how we approach the problem. Okay, thank you. Hey, Pavel, you got my attention when you mentioned you can grab more than what is officially in the NetFlow or IPFIX standard. How many protocols can you decode with your solution from a, a metric standpoint? So uh, is it, uh, do you have a rough number? How much uh, other protocols uh, you can detect yeah. and grab metrics from them? We, we have support for something like 20, 30 uh, most common enterprise protocols. So it's DNS, DHCP, Samba, and things like that. So these are very common in all the environments. We also have support for some OT, OT environment protocols. So for example, IEC 104 or, uh, or DLMS. So this kind of SCADA, SCADA related protocols. And we leverage standard IP fix. So actually our data is according to industry standard. We define enterprise extensions and we uh, create a standard IP fix packet. We provide the templates. So any third party IP fix collector can actually understand and process our data as well. And this also enables us to understand other uh, IP fix data. So if you take Cisco routers with the NetFlow version 10, which is basically IP fix, we can understand HTTP information from Cisco, normalize it to our, to our uh, HTTP information and work with it in, in a standardized way. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the power of using different uh, data sources and combining them in a, like in a single storage and single database. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, I would say the, from a cybersecurity perspective, the interesting stuff is happening in the application layers. Yeah. So there, if you have additional headers, I'm just mentioning HTTP headers or other headers, there is often very useful information. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what you got. And when the system has a suspicion for some, let's say, critical anomaly, that's that's completely configurable, it can capture you full packet stream. So you have your forensics data as well. Quick, quick summary here, which uh, I think we all kind of got to. Don't leave the network out the calculus for your uh, security strategy. Uh, NDR ought to be a part of the framework as you're looking at securing your own environment and helping your customers do the same.